you're here today at the Museum for History, and we're proud to have Coney Island royalty here, Mr. John Reed. Uh, we are a popular culture museum. Uh, so culture and royalty isn't always academic, although uh, the gentleman is a prominent um, ad executive. He comes from royalty at Coney Island Peluso Machinery Work. Machine shop. Machine yeah. shop, uh, which among many other um, machines and metal um, jobs they would do in the neighborhood, quite a bit of it was here in the world's playground. Um, Mr. Ray is a collector. He has an impressive collection of Coney Island. But today's lecture is about authenticating your collection and proving it is what you say it is or what the guy you bought it from told you it was. So I'm fascinated by this. Please give him a big such as this. I came here just yesterday and I was amazed. It brought me right back. So, um, you know, I'm here to talk about my story, uh, about my collection, but I'm also here to talk about people who have influenced me over the years. So um, hopefully you'll get a lot out of that and really understand, you know, I come from a, a design background and a lot of the things that I would see in Coney Island over the years would influence really what I did and in my career. So um, this is a photograph I took many, many years ago when I was um, in college and uh, taking a photography course. Um, and I thought I'd start the slideshow with this. So I was born and raised in Brooklyn. And I went to Brooklyn Tech, which was lots of fun. And um, also went to the School of Visual Arts uh, College on 23rd Street and 3rd Avenue. And I studied design and advertising there. And it was really great because my first job out of, the, out of college was working at Rolling Stone magazine. So I really got to understand editorial design and it also combined my love for music and design. So that was really a great plus. And then from there, working at different design firms, I eventually moved on to the advertising industry. I worked at some very large agencies like McCann Erickson, J. Walter Thompson, Havas, which is where I work now. But before I got to work, work at all those very prestigious ad agencies, my career started here at the Paluzzo Machine and Ironworks factory. Uh, this is my father's, uh, my father's factory. Uh, he came here from Naples, Italy, and he uh, bought and purchased Paluzzo in 1947. So we're going back about uh, 70 years ago. He worked there for about 40 years, and um, as you can see just by the cars, uh, it's really got a, a real quality about it. Um, this is my dad here, and the thing I have to say is he's probably one of the first people to influence me ever, uh, and that's because of his exactness. People always ask me, what did your father do for a living? And I told him he was a carpenter with metal. So if you know anything about uh, turning wood, he uh, was a craftsman at the lathe. Uh, although they had welding and brazing and, and tool and die making there, his real expertise was in lathing, which is uh, interesting because if you look at every ride here, antique ride, like the Wonder Wheel or the Cyclone, you don't just go on Amazon and order a new wheel, right? It has to be created and machined to perfect specifications. And that's really what he did. Um, and of course, I had to work there uh, at a very early age. I'm not going to reveal when, but uh, <laughs> might get into some child uh, abuse laws here. So. Uh, he was recently uh, entered into the, uh, awarded one of the Wizards of West 8th Street, which was uh, a, really, uh, a really nice recognition of everyone on West 8th Street. You had craftsmen there, people who, who would carve horses, you had machine shops, uh, painters, that type of thing, and they finally recognized those people. Um, and I'm sure you've recognized some of the names there, obviously the Bengals and the Monsignores and Paluzzo, which is the machine shop, he, he purchased that shop uh, and they decided to keep the name. 
So that's why my last name is REA, not P-E-L-U-S-O. Now I worked there for about two years, and it was it was pretty uh, pretty intense, uh, hard work. You know, anytime you're working with metal, it's heavy stuff. Anytime there's welding, there's lots of smoke. I would cut myself off, and so I thought, okay, Dad, I think it's time to do something else. Let me give it a shot. I really liked art, so I thought I'd become a, a painter, a sign painter. And he said, well, as long as you're going to go do something that uh, you know you can benefit from financially. So he got me a job at Ruben's Sign Shop. Ruben the painter was uh, on West 15th Street. He had a small little shop. Uh, he was rather old when I worked for him, and I can recognize his style and some of the uh, artwork here on the walls. Uh, he was here for many, many years. He was probably the name uh, that everyone used. And um, this was just an etching I made in college. It was sort of the best recollection of what I could make. But here's another influence in my life, uh, or influencer. He, uh, taught me how to paint signs, and the way to start is to get newspapers. So I would bring all the Daily News newspapers to his shop, and he taught me how to sign paint paper signs on newspapers. And of course, the first three weeks of that is nothing but failure, and it would just go in the garbage until I was ready to finally do that. So I went freelance, you know, like uh, most people, thinks they can start to do it on their own. This is me, probably in my teens, during the 70s, uh, laying out a sign for Ashburland Park, this is when they were trying to bring Casino into Coney Island. So here I am with a giant canvas rolled out in my driveway. Casinos mean jobs. And the interesting thing about sign painting is, is understanding scale. Because when you're laying something out, you're standing three feet away from it, it's a completely different feeling when you back away 300 feet and the scale of things may, may not necessarily read properly. So I learned proportion, I learned that legibility level that was essential in any sign painting. So here's a photograph of Astroland that I took uh, showing the sign up there. One thing I love about this photograph is the chap in the Cadillac making a U-turn. <laughs> really tells the story of coming out of it. I don't know why, it's just perfectly placed there. So. So this is me. I, I uh, in my teens, I was sign painting for uh, uh, the Albert family, whatever they needed. Here's a park reopen sign, and you can start to see uh, my romance with typography and my love of type, and always trying to challenge myself to do something a little different. Um, it's funny, you know. I left my father's shop because of the dangers of working in a uh, the dangers of working in a, uh, a machine shop, but. The Alberts paid me to paint the Astroland logo on the tower. So I said, well, how am I going to get up there? And they said, well, we'll give you a rope, and we'll give you the remote, and the remote reaches the roof of the, the can, and you raise yourself up, and then you lower yourself 20 feet, and you put your letters. So that was pretty crazy. Like, when I think of it today, with high winds and that sort of thing, all of this work usually is done off-season. Uh, nothing can really be done here during the season because they need to be open for business. They can't be shutting down because someone's painting a sign. So I probably did this in the winter under high winds, but I'm the guy who painted the Ashton Tower. So of course my relationship with Ashton Land included doing some work for the, uh, for the cyclone. Uh, you know, the weather and the elements here, being by the beach and all, uh, it wasn't very kind to sign, so it was good for me because I was redoing signs every year. But they really, uh, after taking a little uh, tour of, of Coney Island yesterday, there really isn't any of my original artwork left. So this was um, this piece here on the lower right was a, a, a mural that I did, which was as you came around, right after you got into the car, it would come come up. That was there waiting for you. And you can tell, you know, my love of type and trying to do something unique here. Uh, I think I felt like I was a better designer than I was an illustrator. So some of the some of the imagery here is a little challenging to paint, but I thought the type was quite sound. Uh, here I am, the glamour boy, leaning over a muddy tire to to paint a, uh, a tractor. But for me, this was uh, you know I really loved it and. Uh, it was something that you did at your own speed, and you were left alone, and it was sort of like painting on other people's canvases. So here's a technique that I wanted to just bring forth, because sometimes sign painting is doing multiple signs. And today, everything is done in uh, vinyl letters, and it's cut by a laser. 
So it's really almost impossible to see a hand lettered sign today. But this particular job that was given to me uh, by the uh, Astrolab was to create about 10 signs exactly the same. So there's this technique in sign painting where you use a pounce wheel and you lay it out once and you take this little metal wheel and it almost makes a dotted hole almost similar to the scoring and stamps, you know, those little dotted holes. Well, it makes that for you. And as you trace over your drawing, you then take some charcoal dust or powder and pounce that image onto the metal or whatever surface you're painting on. So here it is in between, and here's the final product. I just love showing this because it's a pay one price for $7, which I think today uh, Luna Park is probably going to send you back $50 or $75. Although the Cyclone was included, so I thought that was really special. My sign painting uh, wasn't limited to only Coney Island, so I did a lot of work for the lovely members of the sanitation industry, uh, which included gold leafing. But I would also do some decorative work <laughs> here, here at the back of most cams or tractors. Uh, you would put yes or no to indicate where you could pass and where you shouldn't pass. And, uh, this was not Photoshop. This is, this, is, this is not manipulated. This is a true story. <laughs> So now let's get back to influencers in my life. Um, I went to go see a, a type designer speak at the uh, at uh, Cooper Union uh, about two years ago. His name is Michael Durrett, and I've been a fan of his work for years. Um, turns out he grew up on Coney Island Avenue. I grew up on Ocean Parkway in Avenue U. So when he spoke, he talked about some photograph that his mother had taken of him and his brother. Uh, standing somewhere near Steeplechase Park, and how looking at the signage, you know, when I look at this photograph, it confirms that all of the memories that I have of Steeplechase Park and Coney Island are not a hallucination or a dream. It really was this special, and this detailed, and this beautiful. And if you look at his work, and I, he was, it was good enough to send me a few samples. He's famous for doing the Kiss album cover uh, many years back. He was. Uh, a type designer that did many Time magazine covers back in the day when illustration was king. And that's, his, that's the spelling of his name. Uh, he's putting out a book of all his type designs. And you can see the influence of Coney Allen and the signage and, and the colors influenced his career. And this is someone who uh, I've always been a fan of his work. And I think it's because everything he did had absolute perfect typographic balance. It's another person in my life that, like my father, really taught me accuracy and, and, and real detail to craft. So uh, I told him, I said I was doing this lecture, he lives in LA now, but I would, I would love to have some of his fan samples and share, share his, uh, his career with us. So I created this brand and now I'm going to start getting into the collection of antiques that I have. Uh, and I thought to create this, this icon called, uh, this logo called the Coney Island Authentic. And um, after I created, like, you know, most type designers work in black and white. And then how do you bring the color scale into something like this? Well, I went to my collection. This is one of those tin toys that was given to me by Fred Garms. And I just took a, an ink dropper and literally took the exact colors from that toy and dropped them into my, my design. So uh, this is my brand, and I feel it has all of the excitement and graphic playfulness that makes Coney Island what it is today, right? So here's the collection. Uh, so I showed you this photograph earlier. I did uh, have the wherewithal uh, to take down my dad's sign when he retired in the late 80s. So I have these tin letters that were, were created um, and donned his shop. He had three locations. He was uh, relocated three times by the lovely Fred C. Trump. Um, I understand that was something that he did a lot to, to people here in Coney Island. So in the year of 2007, my dad and I, he was selling his house and he, uh, we went down to the basement and we had everything just packed up. You know how you collect things and you don't really pay much attention to them. So I thought I'd start this lecture with this piece. Uh, it's made out of bronze and there's no markings on it. So I asked my dad, Where's this from? He said, oh, that was for the, uh, this, uh, the parachute jump. And I said, well, 
you know, for me to come forward with this collection, you have to be able to prove that. How do we authenticate this? So he said, well, all I remember is that we used to make these pieces, and when you went on the ride and you sat down, they would take this hook, and they would hook it above the parachute. And when you reach the top, the spring mechanism would open it, and it would release you, and you'd fall down. And when it did, it would swing under your chair, behind you. So here's this you know, four-pound piece of metal swinging freely behind your chair on a, on a cable. Um, so I started looking at all the photos that I could find uh, in the archives, and this is from Corvus or you know, any of the stock photography uh, sources out there. I even went through some private collections. The closer I looked, it was that clue that my dad gave me. And I started to realize, oh, goodness, there's that piece. So um, the more I looked, the more I started finding it. Now I can't look at this photograph without seeing that. So I'm sure you guys have, have a photograph here that you can refer to and check it out. Uh, the next piece is a, uh, a wheel, uh, very heavy, made of wood, but there is a metal rim around it and certainly a metal, a metal center. And as we looked through the, 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 some of the, uh, the stuff in the basement, we found this, uh, uh, this manual on how to put together the Caterpillar ride. So imagine getting this manual and all of the parts and having them put this together. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Caterpillar ride, but what made it such a, uh, a fan favorite is that it had a tart that would swing over and give you a moment of privacy while it spun around so you and your loved one could have a moment alone. <laughs> Uh, and there's a photograph, a famous photograph from uh, Kurt Hutton uh, called Two at the Fair. Uh, this, is, this was taken in London. Apparently this, this was a ride that was uh, both in Europe and in the States. And here's a photograph of the uh, caterpillar in the back of Steeplechase Park. So this helps authenticate this piece. This wheel weighs about 50 pounds. It's incredibly heavy uh, and in very good condition. By the way, this illustration here is uh, how to put the, ca the car together. Uh, next is a piece that I have framed because, you know, whenever you get anything like a decal, your fear is how, uh, you know, the moisture starts to make things like that curl. So I had it framed against glass, uh, and they were decals. And I noticed that there were these printer registration marks, which help really give you a sense of exactly what this is. And, you know, when you remove uh, that decal, you see the famous logo, of course, uh, that donned the front of Steeplechase Park, and I was able to find these photographs that help authenticate it. It was not only on the whip, which, by the way, came from the Mangles family, uh, but it was also placed on the mirrors, which I think are out here in the hall. If you, if you uh, see those on your way out, definitely check those out. And it's, you know, it's interesting, back in the day there, in the 40s and 30s even, how they understood the, the power of an icon, the power of a brand, uh, and putting it on each of the experiences. It's an interesting uh, story, the, the, the steeplechase space, otherwise known as Tilly, which I think started in Asbury Park, there are many versions of it. So now on to a real prized possession of the collection. This is um, a ticket punch from the 1950s, and it has the name George inscribed on it. Uh, my dad said it came from George Tilly Jr., and it wasn't working for some reason. And the interesting thing about it is it doesn't create a circle. It creates a little um, sort of shield shape, which is what made it so unique. Um, so that's in the collection. And there's a lot of pieces, like obviously the steeplechase tickets that you, people used to wear around their necks. So you'd be given 10 rides. Every, every time you went on a ride, they would punch a hole through it. And there are things like envelopes sort of authenticating that you know my father did do a lot of work for steeplechase park. Um, next is a clown head. This is painted on wood. It's about four feet high. And what's interesting about this piece is, after looking at it, I realized, I kind of remembered it was on the Spookorama, but it was also at the Spook House in uh, Steeplechase Park. And the more I looked at it, I was fascinated by it. And I realized that this is a, a kind of a space helmet on top of a clown. So I did a little bit of research, and I realized that during the 50s, when this was painted, there was a huge fascination with sci-fi. And if you look at a lot of the, uh, the content on, on Amazing Stories and those type of, uh, those type of magazines, uh, you also have the Flash Gordon TV show, there was this huge fascination. And here are artists tapping into that and putting this clown head on a, 
with, with a, with a um, space helmet on. And this is indicative of a lot of these other pieces that I have. Uh, these, these are these panels, these silk screen panels that would be on these coin slot games. So this is one of the other pieces, which is a flying saucers game. I was able to finally, this, was, this came from a private collection, I was finally able to find one. These, there were originally two of these clown heads. This is the other one of them. Um, I remember I was given this piece by Fred Garn, so I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, but when I originally saw it, the second one was really corroded and there was hardly an image there. So this is the one piece I was able to salvage. What's really nice in terms of authenticating this piece uh, above and beyond the photograph is if you turn it around in the back, there's this name painted, Orinato, Steeplechase Park. It's obscured because it's cut off, uh, New, uh, Coney Island, New York. And I asked my dad about it, and he said, oh, well, that's, that's probably Jimmy Orinato, who used to manage Steeplechase Park. And his brother Ralph worked there, and we were always getting passes to Steeplechase Park and all the rides in Pony Island. So uh, there's a pass that I found with, with Ralph's name on it, allowing us into Steeplechase. So now on to shooting galleries. And um, this is a uh, this is interesting because these are metal targets that where they would put in shooting galleries. And I did some research on this, and it turns out, you know, at the turn of the century, they typically would be wilderness targets, like 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 bears and and, and Indians and deer and that sort of thing. Uh, but after the war, it became that they were shooting more things having to do with the military. So here we've got paratroopers and soldiers, and uh, there is the piece kind of authenticated in the lower panel there. One of the targets happens to be Mussolini. So here is turning something as innocent as a shooting gallery into, you know, venting your frustration and your hatred for the, uh, for the war. Uh, this is a silk screen piece, which is very nice. It's about four feet wide, three feet wide. And it says, let's practice test your aim now, drop it out. I can't imagine how politically incorrect this would be today. Um, however, I guess it, this speaks to the time. Now on to the reason for this whole collection, uh, many pieces in this collection. Um, this is Fred Garms. He's the son of the original uh, creator of Wonder Wheel. And he was another big influence in my life. He, uh, he inherited the Wonder Wheel, kept it going until he passed away. I can't remember the year he passed on. But you know, a lot of the stuff in my collection comes from bartering for my sign painting <laughs> services. So out here in Coney Island, you know, there were good years and there were not so good years. And in order to pay me for my services, and I love doing what I did, um, they would very often say, well, I can't afford to give you that. I can't afford to pay you. And I said, well, you have this stuff laying around. You know, maybe I'll take a sign or two. And so that's really how I uh, was able to obtain all of these uh, pieces. So there's a photo of Fred. And here are a couple of pieces that he gave me. And he was kind of a jokester. Um, he would always play tricks on people. I remember he had a fake cast they would put on his arm. And, you know, it was one of those things where I thought, oh, Fred, you broke your arm, and then he'd take the cast off. No, my arm's fine. Um, this piece here is a lighter that if you gave it to someone and they tried to light it, you'd get an electric shock <laughs> by this woman here. This he would impart, uh, implant cigarette loads in people's cigarettes. So as you lit them and halfway through, they would explode. <laughs> Uh, so he was a very colorful character. One of the neat things in the connect collection is we had these uh, two stuffed animals that were in, we had packed them in plastic. So they really uh, hadn't deteriorated at all. They're in mint condition. And it's interesting, you know, back in the day in the 40s and 50s, you know, there was no such thing as uh, licensing. Like today you go out and you, 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 you compete and try to win a SpongeBob doll or an Elmo doll. But, in those days, you went out, you know, you want a poodle, or you want a tiger, and it wasn't connected to any kind of marketing idea, which really spoke to the innocence. So. Uh, these are some photographs that he gave me of the interior of Spookorama, some of the characters, the Invisible Man, Flying Witch. Uh, and, you know, in the 60s, he had the uh, foresight to use black light technology, and he had some painters uh, depict 
some imagery in Dayglow art. So as you went through the spook house, it had a really eerie quality to it. This is a piece that I believe Danny Casola painted, uh, very famous for painting uh, lots of uh, circus signage and, uh, and, and canvases. So this is the uh, old King Cole with the three, uh, the three fiddlers. This actually moves, the, uh, the arms move and the, the king's uh, stomach moves up and down as he sleeps away. Uh, the base my father built and um, he had a custom make a reduction motor so that the movement would be very slow. And this was just kind of tossed in a back room somewhere so I was able to uh, hang on to that. As we come around to the end of the collection, um, this is one of the books, uh, the, the directory, directory that's dated in uh, 1923. And I really like how it, it urges residents to give local merchants in Coney Island all their patronage. Don't travel to NYC for anything. <laughs> Buy and CI. So this is pre-Google. And if you really need to find someone, you would use this like a Yellow Pages phone book and uh, figure out where you would get things. I believe my dad's shop is in there as well. So to kind of bring this full circle, it's interesting. Uh, I just recently did this signage in, uh, for a, uh, um, a history tour that's taking place in Dino's Wonder Wheel Park. Um, if you go there, there's about uh, a dozen of these signs kind of authenticating these very antique rides uh, and, and pieces that you know have been uh, there for many, many years. And it was really nice to be able to you know, use my typography background and, and create something that people can enjoy. There's a, a small pamphlet that identifies you know, each of the individual pieces. That's my dad uh, last year when he was inducted into the Hall of Fame. That's my son, and um, it's just amazing to see the three generations standing there here in Coney Island for me. Yesterday we had a shoot, and we had a photographer who had a, a drone. So he was able to get this very unique perspective. Uh, the uh, It almost makes you dizzy looking at it a little. Uh, it is the... Uh, the parachute tower, and uh, I never realized that there are 12 stations. Uh, like, I guess they modeled it after a clock, and that's a very unique perspective, I think. Thank you so much for coming, and if any of you want to, you know, have any questions or contact me, that's my email. I want to comment uh, the scene of a photo of the shop and a business card. The spiral staircase in our lobby downstairs was made. Uh, yeah, he uh, in my speech when he got uh, when he was awarded uh, in the Hall of Fame. My speech was he came to this country from Naples to make his mark, and he literally did. You know his his, his work is implanted all throughout Coney Island, and he literally did make his mark in Coney Island, so. Uh, it was one of those things, though, they didn't, you know, they didn't hammer in their name, you know, it was just kind of a bespoke crash, uh, craftsmanship that, you know, it wasn't about marketing, it was about word of mouth, and he was one of those institutions here that he worked weekends, he was always, always busy, because, you know, if you do something really well here, uh, people tell others about it, so it was an interesting way to grow up.